listening to my maiden speech, and I thank you for your time, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honourable Member. Well done, and uh, you're off to a, a, good, a good start. Uh, I'll now um, recognize the um, Honourable Member from Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. My turn. Mr. Speaker, it's an honour and a privilege to be here today representing the proud constituency of Yarmouth in the Legislative Assembly of the great province of Nova Scotia. Yarmouth is my home, it's the home of my family, and the home of many proud and resilient people. And it is a, an absolute honor and privilege to represent all of them here. In the previous positions I've held representing students or working in the public service, I've actually watched the uh, business of Province House from the outside. So I do know I'm in for a real treat being on the inside with all these distinguished members. Um, I, of course, wouldn't be here without the help of a driven, dedicated, and hardworking campaign team. I would not be here without the donors who generously contributed to our campaign or the many volunteers who gave their time and energy to see that our campaign was a success. Now, Jeff had to go and list all of his people. <laughs> I won't be doing that today, but to all those who were involved in our campaign, whether they were making calls, asking for money, canvassing with me, giving money, or anything else, I want to thank them and recognize them here in the Legislative Assembly. I'd like to extend a special thank you to my family, the Churchills and the Besheras, for their enduring support and love, which has long been a pillar of strength for me, and I'm sure will continue to be. I'd like to particularly recognize and thank my parents, Joanne Beshera and Jack Churchill, for being great parents and for their support during the campaign. In fact, I believe one of the biggest reasons I was elected, Mr. Speaker, was because of the respect my mother and father have in our community, due to the strength of character. Due to the strength of character they both have as individuals. Door to door I would hear, I played hockey with your father. That wasn't always a good thing. <laughs> or I worked for your father or your mother taught me. They're good people. This is what I heard at the doorstep. And it made me so proud to be their son. At one door in particular, an elderly woman proceeded to tell me she wasn't voting at all for anyone because all politicians were the same. They don't care about people. They only care about themselves. I wasn't able to get one word in before she turned my brochure around and said, oh, you're Joanne's boy. I'm sorry, you have my vote. <laughs> you see, Mr. Speaker, I'm lucky to have the parents I do. Mr. Speaker, it was a very enlightening experience canvassing door to door throughout the District of Yarmouth. Everywhere, whether I was in South End, Sanford, Port Maitland, Brenton, Carlton, Kempville, Deerfield, Hebron, Pembroke, Chabog, Rockville, Ohio, maybe I should have listed all the names of my supporters, <laughs> Arcadia, Pinckney's Point, or any of the other beautiful and unique communities of our district, I did hear a constant refrain, a refrain that has continued throughout Yarmouth since the day of that by-election. And I am saddened that I do have to share that refrain today. We are being ignored, I heard. We have been forgotten, and we've become isolated. This has been followed by a simple but compelling and very sincere question. Why? Why? Why is this happening to us? Unfortunately, I neither had nor have an answer. These feelings, Mr. Speaker, are mostly due to this government's decision in 2009 to cut the Yarmouth Ferry Link to New England, a decision which has had a devastating impact on our economy and on the surrounding area, and on the lives of many business owners and families in our, in our district. I've met with unemployed ferry workers, some of whom had worked on a ferry in Yarmouth for the entirety of their adult lives, who are now without work and deeply concerned about their future and the future of their families. I've talked to tourism operators and business owners whose livelihood is dependent on a ferry service between Yarmouth and New England. Just this past Monday, members of the Liberal Caucus hosted a roundtable in Yarmouth with local tourism operators 
and business owners to discuss the impact that the ferry loss has had on them. They provided us with their numbers, and I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, the numbers were stark. And we did have a special guest at that meeting, uh, Chris Dontremont, <laughs> member of the, the PC caucus. Uh, order, order, uh, honorable member, I just remind uh, just for the House that you know, you're not to use uh, Christian names or first names of, of members, and uh, I've noticed both the past two speakers have done that, so. Okay. <laughs> So just, just, just for your information, that's a rule of the House not to use Christian names, okay? The Honourable Member for Yarmouth. <laughs> and the numbers were stark, Mr. Speaker. Neil Hiskin of the McKinnon Can Inn reported an 80% drop in American visitors, and he has had to lay off all of his staff. David Darby, director of the Yarmouth Firefighters Museum, reported that American visitations were down 86.7%. Bruce Bishop, director of the Yarmouth County Museum and Archives, reported that archival visits in 2010 were down over 40 percent since 2009. Bill Curry, fifth generation owner and operator of Tightline Guides, reported that after the government's announcement on the cut to the ferry, he lost every single one of his bookings for the 2010 season. Brenda Dowsett of Canada Glass Art reported that her business is down 67 percent since 2009. She had to lay off all five of her full-time staff. Brian Rodney, a tourism operator, is in the process of converting his hotel and restaurant businesses into housing units and has been forced to lay off 20 of his staff, five of whom had been with him for over 20 years. Nancy Knowles of the Yarmouth Light, Yarmouth's famous, beautiful, and historic lighthouse, reported that there has been a 79% drop in American visitors to Yarmouth, to the Yarmouth Light. Sharon Lloyd of the Yarmouth Wool Shop reported 40% drop in business between 2009 and 2010. Carleen McDonald, owner and operator of Waterwood Bed and Breakfast, reported a 20% drop in occupancy attributed directly to the loss of the ferry. Rose Madden of Yarmouth and Acadian Shores reported that visitors to their information center decreased by 63% this year. They had 3,000 American visitors in 2009 and 500 in 2010. Just this week, I spoke with Mark Rod, President and CEO of Rod Hotels and Resorts, owner of the Colony and Harbor Inn and the Rod Grand Hotel, the two, the two largest hotels in Yarmouth. He informed me that between 2009 and 2010, the Colony is down 600 room, 600 room nights. They have suffered a loss of $120,000 in room revenues and $175,000 in food and beverage revenues. The Grand Hotel, which has also uh, suffered a loss, is down 2,500 rooms and has suffered financial losses of 300,000 in room revenues and 150,000 in food and beverage revenues. The grand, the grand total of Mark Rod's loss on these two businesses in Yarmouth, a staggering $745,000. The only reason he has stayed open is because of his commitment to the people of Yarmouth and his hope that the community will secure a ferry service for 2011. Mr. Speaker, if there is no ferry service, I wonder how he will be able to keep his doors open and what will happen to the 150 people that are employed by the Rod Company in Yarmouth. I've spoken with Canada Border Service Agency's officers at the Port of Yarmouth who could lose their jobs if there's no international ferry service next year. These are good-paying jobs and have become staple jobs in our community. And unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, these disheartening stories do not end with the impact of the ferry loss. I've also spoken to seniors and individuals of all ages who are without a family doctor and who are forced to wait sometimes more than 12 hours just to get their prescriptions filled. Estimates of individuals without a family doctor in Yarmouth range from 3,500 to over 8,000. And unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, we don't know those numbers, um, what, the, what the number is for sure. I've talked to fishermen bringing their catch ashore to prices that are lower than ever, proud fishermen who break their backs day in and day out to bring us fish worried about the future of their precious livelihood. I've heard from concerned community members along the Tusket water system, faced with blooms of blue-green algae, also known as cyanobacteria, which can have long-term chronic effects on human health. To date, there has been nothing done to clean these toxins up or to even warn local residents and summer visitors of the dangers in the water. I've met with youth who are homeless and fearful of the coming winter months, farmers who are worried about the future of their local agriculture industry and their ability to sell their nutritious 
and delicious produce. I've met with herring workers struggling to find work and secure the hours they need to qualify for employment insurance. I've spoken with single parents struggling to find money for their children's medication, let alone for university or college. I've talked to countless young people, like maybe the friends and children of the members of this House, doubting if they will able, be able to make a future in Yarmouth with their family or even in Nova Scotia, close to home. Mr. Speaker, these are the stories of my community. Stories of neighbours, friends, fathers, mothers, sons and daughters. This has become our story, Yarmouth's story. And I'm energized to represent the people of Yarmouth in this House because I believe that story can change. Mr. Speaker, is government to blame for all these things? Can government fix all these things? Perhaps not. The challenges that Yarmouth and the province face are in part due to global trends and events that few people have control over. Many parts of North America are faced with an aging population, so there are less young people and a higher demand on our health care services. And many regions in our country are facing a doctor shortage. The world is dealing with a phenomenon of urbanization with more and more people moving into cities. There was a global downturn in American tourism, and the world just went through a massive recession. Locally, the price of our fish has gone down, the Canadian dollar has gone up, and herring are staying at the bottom of the ocean where they can't be caught. But this government's decisions have impacted and will continue to impact the outcomes in this province and the lives of people in our communities. Government can partner with businesses, industry, and communities like ours in Yarmouth to help to create the conditions for success in certain areas. In Yarmouth, that means treating our ferry as an economic investment and helping the area secure a ferry service for next year. So that's, that's what it is, Mr. Speaker. It's an economic investment. As Spencer Consulting has just recently reported, an annual $6 million investment in the Yarmouth New England Ferry Service would yield over $22 million in profits for the province of Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, it is also important to note that the data used in this report is from the provincial and federal tourism statistics compiled during the recession. Just imagine what those numbers would be based on good tourism seasons. I was asked yesterday by the Minister of Economic and Rural Development to table that report, and I'd like to table that today, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I just read today that this government will be extending its subsidy to the CB Rail. And I, I did read a quote from the Minister of Economic and Rural Development that said, uh, this shouldn't be compared till September of next year. That this shouldn't be compared to a ferry service in Yarmouth because when rails are gone, they can never come back. I just want to assure the Minister in this House, with infrastructure changing in, in Yarmouth, with tourism operators changing their business models from bed and breakfast, motels, hotels, to housing units, with restaurants closing, and with our port status in jeopardy. If we don't have a ferry service next year, Mr. Speaker, ours might be gone forever as well. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, a partner in government means supporting our entrepreneurs and small businesses and not burdening them with high business tax. Reviewing our current incentive programs to recruit and retain doctors in rural areas identifying the areas where we're not competing and developing new creative solutions to addressing our current doctor shortage. It means promoting local farmers and producers, helping our farmers develop local markets to sell their produce and creating province-wide regulations to promote our high-quality local products. It means providing financial support to community groups like the Tri-County Women's Centre and the SHIFT initiative who are trying to address the issue of homelessness in youth in our communities. It means working with our municipal governments to get a regional development agency back in southwestern Nova Scotia to help recruit industry, create jobs, and grow the economy. Because, Mr. Speaker, I'll be very clear, the people of Yarmouth don't want a handout. The people of Yarmouth just want to work. They want to partner in this government. They want to be productive. They want an economic success story where tourism is strengthened, where the fishery is thriving, where industry is growing, where small businesses are flourishing, 
where entrepreneurs are able to pursue their dreams, where young people are able to find jobs at home so they can be with their families, and where all people are able to live happy and healthy lives. Mr. Speaker, these are the hopes of my community, and these are the hopes I'll be championing on its behalf in this House. Through me, Mr. Speaker, you will hear the anger, frustration, and confusion of my constituents. Constituents that do feel abandoned, that feel forgotten, and that feel their hopes aren't fully being, being reached. In me, however, Mr. Speaker, you will find someone always willing to extend a hand across partisan lines to work for the good of my community, the good of the province of Nova Scotia, if, if a hand is extended back. Mr. Speaker, one of my professors at St. Mary's, Maggie Abdul-Masih, who is an inspiration to her students, much like the member from Halifax Citadel, Sable Island is, asked our class a question during one of our weekly sessions. She asked, do you know what builds bridges? Do you know what breaks down misconceptions? Do you know what fosters understanding? What brings people together and in so doing, what changes the world? We, in our infinite wisdom, replied with what we thought was a brilliant answer. We said, love. She said, nice try. It comes before love. She said, friendship. Friendship changes the world. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to developing friendships with all the distinguished members of this House, to develop friendships that are forged in our common desire and mission to improve our communities and make Nova Scotia a better place to live for all of our citizens. Mr. Speaker, if we work together, we can address the challenges that my community faces in Yarmouth, the challenges that communities face across this province, and the challenges that our province faces as a whole. Because, Mr. Speaker, by working together, all is possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honourable Member, and uh, you too are off to a good start. Uh, uh, the uh, Honourable Member for uh, Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's a real pleasure to rise here and just to follow my uh, uh, student, uh, Zach Churchill, and, uh, and the... Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Let me take that back, Mrs. Uh, the rule I, I, in the House is we don't <laughs> use surnames or Christian names, so uh, just so a reminder, uh, Honourable I Member, did. not to use uh, the uh, first uh, names. I, I, uh, I heard you. I heard you, Mr. Speaker, uh, earlier on caution him on, on this very point, and obviously we, we both uh, missed that lecture, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> uh, let, let me... Uh, let me start again, Mr. Speaker. Yes. I would like to congratulate the, honor, the, the Honourable Member from Yarmouth Very and the good. Member from Glace Bay on just a great start to their first uh, uh, two days in this House. I heard them yesterday in question period, uh, and I know that they will uh, carry that spirit of cooperation and constructive engagement uh, that they showed uh, today in this, uh, in this House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, both uh, the honourable members uh, talked about uh, the great honour and privilege it is to serve in this House, uh, and they both talked uh, in the same way that I feel, that uh, as representatives uh, here, we carry uh, not only uh, the hopes and aspirations and dreams of the constituencies uh, we represent, but we also carry the hopes and dreams of our families, uh, our, our parents, our friends, and all of us who have gone uh, before. We represent, uh, in many ways, the, the collective efforts uh, of those people to, to get us uh, to where we are. So I want to congratulate the um, honorable members from Glace Bay and Yarmouth, in particular, for reminding us of that great heritage, of reminding us of, of our obligations to our constituencies, to our communities, to our families, uh, and to each other. I know that uh, the honorable member from uh, Glace Bay talked about some of the things that he heard on the doorstep in Glace Bay. Um, Mr. Speaker, I was in Glace Bay as well for the, for the campaign, and I heard uh, much the same thing. I heard uh, that there is a, a lack of faith uh, in politics and politicians. 
that, uh, that we do need to, to restore hope, that we do need to, to, to earn uh, the trust of our, of our constituents, uh, to convince them that we, in fact, are, are there to serve uh, the people. And in the four years that I've been in this House, Mr. Speaker, I honestly believe that all my, uh, my colleagues on both sides of the House uh, believe that, that they are here to serve the people, that they believe that, that they can make a difference, they would like to make a difference, and they would like to leave their constituencies in the province a better place at the end of it. And I'm, 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 I'm delighted to say that I, I, I think that in Glace Bay, when I was in Glace Bay, we still had that sense of faith and hope uh, on the doorsteps, that although people may be disillusioned, uh, they are not so disillusioned that they would not pick a good MLAs and they would not vote and they would not talk about their hopes and aspirations. And it's the same in my constituency, Mr. Speaker, of Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. I must say, when I started, uh, when I was first asked to run for office, I didn't like the idea of going door to door and knocking on doors. I shared the sense that many people had that, you know, politicians uh, were intruding on, on, on people's spaces, that they were bothering people when they were uh, interested in other things. My constituents, Mr. Speaker, are happy to see me at the door, and I, I now try and spend as much time as I can on the doorstep. And yes, they do tell me that they're fed up with the system, that there are things about the system that they would like to change. But I'm happy to say that they like their individual MLAs. They like their politicians. They believe that any time they come into contact with the office, they're happy with the, with the response they get. They're re happy with the, with the follow-up. And I think that's something to, to keep in mind, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we have as, as, as MLAs an obligation to our, to our communities and our constituencies. And people honestly believe that we are doing the best job uh, that we can uh, for them. I agree with the, with the, with the member from, um, from Glace Bay when he talks about the need uh, for, for engagement, for a more inclusive politics, for a more empowering uh, politics. I too heard that, Mr. Speaker. And when I was in Glace Bay, I was surprised at the number of people who said uh, that uh, they had four or five people registered in their homes, and yet only one or two or two or three of them were there. They had spouses, or they had brothers, or sisters, or children who were away, and that those children uh, wanted to come back. We have the same issues here in, in Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island, Mr. Speaker, and we too would like to, to, to bring back many of the, the, the people who have, who have left. We would like to keep many of the young people who want to, to, to work here. We too would like to empower people. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are engaging in a program to do that, uh, that very thing. People on, my, on, on the doorstep at Halifax Citadel, Sable Island, also told me, Mr. Speaker, that they would like us to make life better for Nova Scotian families. They told us that they would like better health care, that they would like to reduce wait times. And I'm happy to say that the Minister of Health the Minister of Health Promotion has embarked on that very thing, that we are responding to that need that we have heard on, 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 on the doorstep. And they want better jobs. They want more meaningful jobs. They want jobs that are innovative. They want jobs that are challenging them. And that's something that we are also embarking on. But above all, Mr. Speaker, they would like us to live within our means. They would like all of those things, but they would also un understand that we have to, 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 uh, to do what we can to make sure that our, our revenues match our expenses, that we have to generate ways uh, of raising more revenues, or we have to find ways of cutting costs, or we have to find ways of reallocating costs and using our monies in the most efficient way. So, Mr. Speaker, while we, I share with the member uh, from Glace Bay and the member from Yarmouth uh, that our constituents want us to do a number of things they would also like us to do more, more direct uh, things to, to help um, make Nova Scotia a better place and put Nova Scotia in a better position uh, down the road to do many of the things that we want to do, to meet many of the hopes and aspirations and dreams uh, that they have. And so I want to commend the, me the members uh, from, from Glace Bay and, uh, and Yarmouth on, on, on reminding us of that and bringing those things forward. Now, I have a special fondness for the member uh, from Yarmouth. Uh, he and I have been together for many years, and maybe it was my familiarity that, uh, that, uh, that made me refer to him by name and his first name. We, we, we do, we started out as, as, as a student of mine, but we are friends, and over the years, I have watched his, his career blossom. <laughs> 
he was a very active and, and, uh, and productive and effective uh, student on campus. And I know that he brought to the campus a certain energy uh, and, and sense of, uh, of enterprise. Uh, I spent a lot of time with, uh, with faculty and staff and students and was a great uh, bridge builder. And I think he will, uh, I, I look forward to him playing a similar role in his constituency and also building a bridge uh, with, with, with government and with his uh, colleagues in the House. Uh, I know that he and I have talked uh, before about, the, about this, uh, that although we spend a lot of time, and the public generally has the impression that we spend a lot of time arguing uh, with each other, the fact of the matter is uh, that politics and the future belongs to those who build bridges and those who are constructive and those who come forward uh, with good ideas. And I know that uh, when I was on the other side of the House, there were ministers that we worked with that engaged in that process, and it was a constructive process, and we were able to accomplish a great deal because we did have our eye on our constituencies, and we did have our eye on the greater good of Nova Scotia. And I believe, uh, as I said earlier, that the members of this House share that commitment uh, to this uh, larger purpose. And uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted to, to you know, at, at the tone and, and the direction uh, that, uh, that both of them and, and, and the member from, from Yarmouth has, has taken. That's not to say you couldn't uh, uh, advocate. That's, that's not to say that you cannot advocate. That's not to say you can't uh, uh, embark on, a, on, a, on, a, on an aggressive um, pattern and defense of, of your constituencies, but it has to be respectful and it has to be constructive, and I appreciate their, uh, their initial um, uh, contribution to the House. I want to say something, Mr. Speaker, uh, about my constituency of Halifax, uh, Citadel, Sable Island. And I was hoping to say more um, than, uh, than I could. The, the member for Halifax Atlantic is, sh is sitting beside me, so maybe uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say less. But she and I share a common um, uh, waterway called the Northwest Arm, and I wanted to, to start there because we, we both, I believe, began our, our political uh, careers uh, or, or were drawn to politics uh, from activities that revolved around the Northwest arm uh, itself, and uh, she has been uh, written a great history about the Northwest Arm, so I don't want to recount that history here. But let me uh, begin uh, by saying, you know, that the history of my constituency goes back uh, to its founding uh, uh, by the Mi'kmaq people uh, on the Northwest Arm. It was a gathering place and, uh, and later on came to be uh, called the Northwest Arm. But the Mi'kmaq called it uh, salt water all the way up, and they called it a gathering place. And so I want to pay tribute to those originally founding settlers on the Northwest Arm that eventually um, uh, became part of uh, Halifax Citadel, uh, Sable Island. I should say, Mr. Speaker, that on the Northwest Arm, we had some uh, very uh, famous um, residents. Joe Howe lived on the Northwest Arm. Samuel Kennard, the, 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 the builder of those great ships that made uh, Nova Scotia uh, so famous. Uh, Sir Charles Tupper, uh, Sir Sanford Fleming um, lived on the Northwest Arm, Mr. Speaker. The, 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 um, the, the charter of the uh, intercolonial uh, railway, so, uh, a, a great surveyor, the, uh, the, the person who, uh, who uh, conceived of standard, uh, standard time. Uh, lots of famous people lived uh, along on the Northwest Arm, Mr. Speaker, and those people helped build Nova Scotia, they helped build uh, uh, this province, and they helped build this country, and I'm proud to represent uh, a constituency with that history. We also, Mr. Speaker, have a number of, uh, of, of, of places on the Northwest Arm uh, that uh, help define uh, who, who we are. Uh, St. George's Island. George's Island, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, was, uh, was the site of, of many uh, fortifications of the beginnings of, of, the, of the setting up of the defense of, 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 of Halifax Harbor, uh, which uh, this town of Halifax was later founded in, in 1745. I always find it ironic, Mr. Speaker, uh, especially on Canada Day, uh, when uh, I'm asked to, to speak at, uh, at Pier 21 and, and Citadel Hill. And Pier 21 uh, is, is, is one of those places where we have welcomed uh, people from all over the world, millions of people from all over the world. We have set off uh, ships and, 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 uh, and veterans to fight in a variety of, of wars. 
Uh, we have uh, set up fortifications to keep people out. And yet, uh, about a half an hour later, I have to race up Citadel Hill, and, uh, and we have this, uh, this other uh, Halifax, uh, this Halifax of, of, uh, of fortifications. And my constituency, in, in, in many ways, represents that dual history of, of, of Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, where we have been in the forefront of the struggle to promote peace and democracy and, and preserve our security all over the world. But we have also been a welcoming place for people all over the world. I want to say something, Mr. Speaker, about the larger uh, role of, of, the, of the city of Halifax and Halifax Citadel in, 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 in Nova Scotian um, uh, politics. In my constituency, Mr. Mr. Speaker, are a number of, of, of universities. In fact, I have six universities in, in Halifax uh, Citadel, uh, Sable Island. It's very much a center of, 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 of learning, a center of innovation uh, with great faculty staff, uh, students, a place for leading uh, research. Dalhousie uh, University, Mr. Speaker, a large institution. Um, I, I, I live in, in, in the neighborhood. Um, in the center of a number of things that, that we as a government have identified as, as important to our program. The, 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 in, in the last uh, several months, uh, there have been um, research studies reporting on the, the Center uh, for Study of Immunovaccines, the Center in the Struggle to Fight, uh, that's a, a, a university that's in the center of the fight against uh, the spread of, of the disease. Uh, the Brain Research Center, Mr. Speaker, um, MRIs that map uh, the, uh, the, the, the human brain and identifying very early uh, some um, uh, genetic uh, genetic flaws, genetic predispositions of, of, uh, of trying to, pre to, pre to prevent and anticipate uh, health-related uh, events. The Center for Oceans Research, Mr. Speaker, uh, and quite an extraordinary uh, project, I believe a $168 million project uh, that looks at the oceans, maps the oceans, uh, the, the, the movement of, uh, of, uh, of uh, living things in the ocean, uh, the temperature, uh, and research, and Mr. Speaker, that will tell us a lot about global warming, uh, about the state of, of, of the universe, a huge in international project uh, that uh, says a great deal about uh, our capacity to do uh, work on the front end of, uh, of, of research and innovation. And Mr. Speaker, I'm still a, a faculty member on leave at St. Mary's University, so I would be remiss in not saying, uh, saying more about uh, St. Mary's. St. Mary's, as you know, uh, Mr. Speaker, was founded on the Jesuit tradition. The, Jesuit, the Jesuits, as you know, um, focused on excellence in academics and athletics. And St. Mary's in, in, in still embodies that spirit uh, of the Jesuits. In fact, I had an office, Mr. Speaker, that, uh, uh, that was occupied, uh, that was a residence of, of, of a Jesuit priest, and it had a sink, and it had items on the wall, and every day it reminded me of, uh, of, uh, of, of the Jesuit tradition at St. Mary's. And one day I was uh, sitting in my office and a Jesuit priest uh, came in and he said to me, you know, this is a great office and a great institution and we formed this institution as a public service. We formed this institution to deal with questions of inequality and poverty and injustice, that we believed that education was an important uh, tool in, in developing people. And St. Mary's still carries on that tradition, Mr. Speaker. I dare say that St. Mary's gets more students from all over Nova Scotia and, 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 and students from all socioeconomic classes. And the value added of a St. Mary's education uh, is clear, that St. Mary's University uh, has remained true to that tradition of playing a role both in academics and athletics but also to play a, a role in the, in the improvement uh, of our province and our, our, our citizens. My two children are, are, are uh, well, my, my daughter Kate is about to graduate from the Mr. Speaker, but my, my two children are, are both at St. Mary's, and I'm delighted that, uh, that they have thrived uh, in, in those uh, conditions at St. Mary's. Last week, um, it was my pleasure to, to welcome a, a delegation uh, from the city of Xiamen in, in, in China. 
and uh, they were looking into uh, the possibility of twinning with Halifax. And it was a real pleasure to, 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 to listen to those senior uh, administrators and, and, and civic officials from, from Xiamen talk about the city of Halifax, to talk about my constituency and how beautiful it was and how, how diverse it was and how lively it was with the, with, the, with the student population. And they were very excited about the, the possibility of, of, uh, of twinning uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, with our city of, uh, of Halifax. Uh, in fact, thousands of students have started to come uh, from China to St. Mary's University and to Dalhousie and to the other universities in, in, in my constituency. And they've added a, a, a whole new level of, uh, of, uh, of variety, of innovation, of creativity uh, to my constituency. And the Atlantic School of Theology is, is in my constituency, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Atlantic School of Theology is, is one of those uh, great uh, ec 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 ecumenical sort of interfaith universities now. It has attracted um, the scholars uh, from all over, over the world to look at the larger spiritual and ethical issues uh, that challenge us. And I want to congratulate the Reverend Canon Eric Beresford for his leadership uh, at uh, the Atlantic School of Theology. Last week, I was at an event, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, where Mark Tewksbury, uh, Canada's Olympic uh, uh, swimmer and member of the International Olympic Committee, uh, was talking about corruption at the International Oli Olympic Committee and how disgusted he was at the way in which decisions are made and, and what he witnessed there. And his commitment to, to trying to change the, the, the Olympic Committee, of trying to remind us of what sport was all about and what sport means and what the limits of competition are and what the boundaries are in any kind of competition. And what Mark Tewksbury had to say about ethics uh, applies very much uh, to other um, endeavors in life, to, 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 to business and, 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 to, and to politics. But uh, I, wa I want to thank the, um, the Atlantic School of Theology, in particular for its partnership with St. Mary's uh, University uh, on, the, uh, the, on, on, on its work in, in raising ethical issues and reminding us of, uh, of, of, of uh, the uh, philosophical uh, bases and principles that govern or ought to govern the conduct of, um, of politics and business and, and sport. And Mr. Speaker, my constituency also includes the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Um, I've had the pleasure of being on their campus uh, many times over the last several months. And I was at a competition, an art competition, uh, over the summer. And it's quite extraordinary, the work that's being done there. I had always associated art with, the, with, the, with pure art. But the, the students at, at NASCAD have been able to, to marry art and, and, and business and, uh, and tourism and a whole variety of things. They brought this together and they're using their art to make political statements. They're using their art to define our province. They're using their art to, 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 to promote innovation and, comp and, 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 uh, inno and competitiveness and entrepreneurship. And it's, it's wonderful to see the difference that they have made in my constituency. Everywhere you go, Mr. Speaker, you see students from the College of Art and Design. And there, there isn't a protest out here in Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island uh, that doesn't include uh, some of the work of the stu uh, students from the Nova Scotia College of Art and, and, and Design. So they're using, uh, they're using their, their art in, in very, very productive um, and, uh, and, and innovative ways. And it's, it's, it's great to, to have them uh, in my constituency. And just down the road for me, Mr. Speaker, is the Université Saint Anne, um, um, which is uh, in the forefront of, of, of reminding us of our, of our Acadian heritage, of, 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 of connecting us uh, to, uh, to, to, the, to, fact, uh, to the fact of bilingualism in, 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 in Canada. And many of us in the House here, Mr. Speaker, have taken French language courses. Uh, and thanks very much to the Office of the Speaker for making those things uh, possible. But uh, the University of St. Anne has played a, a great role in building uh, this province and building uh, our, our founding uh, peoples, uh, both uh, in an Acadian context and also from the larger uh, French-English uh, definition that has made this country uh, what it is. 
And so, Mr. Speaker, as, as I was, uh, began to say, I'm delighted that the universities uh, are at the, at the center of, of life in my constituency. Uh, they contribute uh, to the economic well-being of our province. They contribute to, to innovation, they, to productivity. Uh, they bring large numbers of students, and that adds to the, to the diversity and vitality uh, of, of, my, uh, of my constituency. And uh, as a government, we're looking very much forward to the universities playing a leading role in delivering some of those things that we talked about earlier, better health care, better jobs, and, 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 getting us, uh, and playing a role in getting us uh, back to balance uh, uh, with, our, with our, our fiscal uh, crisis that we, uh, that we face. And I wanted to say something, Mr. Speaker, uh, about the economy of, of Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Um, Many people refer to Halifax and HRM as the hub of, of the maritime economy, as the hub of Nova Scotia. And my constituency lies the, at the heart of that, of, of, that, of that hub. And I'm delighted at the role that it, that, that it, that it, that it, that it plays and continues to, to play in Nova Scotia. It is the center of, of, the, of, of the banking and financial uh, uh, services. It is, and and, and that's, it's a growing uh, sector. And in particular, Mr. Speaker, uh, before I talk about specific elements of that economy, I want to talk about the, uh, this spring, the two business associations in my constituency. I must say, when I started out in, in, in politics, uh, I wasn't that, uh, that sure that I could, uh, I could work with the, with the business community because uh, there was this public impression of what uh, the business, uh, business uh, community was about. I remember very early, Mr. Speaker, in, 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 my, in my political career, which doesn't go back very far, but uh, in, in 2006, uh, I had heard that uh, there were panhandlers on, on Spring Garden Road who were being so-called hassled by a certain Mr. Bernie Smith from the Spring Garden uh, Area Business Association. And I'd called Mr. Smith up and I said I wanted to talk to him at the, uh, you know, about what was going on in Spring Garden uh, Road. And he said, you know, Leonard, I, I, I see every day kids on Spring Garden Road. And they're sitting there, and I want to know where they're coming from, uh, what, uh, what brought them here, or what it would take uh, to get them off the streets. And he said, so I do go and talk to them. And yes, I do try and find a, a way to get them off the street. And I do get them off the street, not necessarily because it's good for business, but because it's good for those young people as well. And so, Mr. Speaker, I too got in the, into the habit of talking to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the young people on, on Spring Garden Road. And I did learn an awful lot about, about, uh, about where they come from. Not I'm not that old, Mr. Speaker. But I do talk uh, to, to, those, uh, to those young people on, on, on Spring Garden Road. And many of those young people are there because things have failed in their communities. Uh, where, where they come from. They're not all residents of, of Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. They are residents from all across province, uh, province. Some of them, many of them, I would say, are amazingly creative, very bright young people who were just not able to, uh, to, uh, to work with others in their community or their schools, or I should say their schools and their communities and their families were not able to handle their, uh, their creativity. Many of them are there because their systems have broken down, that they didn't, they didn't or couldn't get the support uh, they needed. But I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that I was delighted that I did speak with, uh, with uh, Mr. Smith uh, that day in the Spring Garden Area Merchants Association. It has led to a very long uh, and, and productive uh, friendship. Um, and uh, I, I, last week, we, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, resigned or, or, or retired from the Spring Garden Area uh, Business Association. And I would like to use this occasion to thank Mr. Smith uh, for the great work he did uh, or is doing on, on, on Spring Garden Area uh, Business Association. I, I also want to say something about the Downtown Halifax uh, Business uh, Commission. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've met with them uh, uh, regularly, uh, particularly uh, 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 Paul McKinnon. And Mr. McKinnon and I first uh, came into contact with each other when we both wanted to do something about the Barrington Street uh, Heritage uh, District. And over the years uh, that uh, we have worked together, the last uh, three or four years, uh, he has fought very hard 
to, uh, to, to make the uh, down to bring that downtown Halifax business district plan, the heritage district plan to a fruition. Just in the last year, we've seen some of those incentives uh, brought forward and uh, more people are, uh, are, are taking that up. But we do share a commitment uh, to, to the Barrington Street Heritage District. We may not agree on, on everything relating to, to development in downtown Halifax, Mr. Speaker, but we do share a commitment uh, to, to preserving our heritage, to making heritage an important part of our development, and also to bring more residents downtown to make Halifax uh, a, livable, uh, a livable city. Mr. Smith and, and Mr. McKinnon uh, were in the center, uh, uh, were in the forefront of creating a program uh, that uh, we uh, that we we initiated uh, four or five years ago. Out of those conversations uh, with people on on Spring Garden Road, uh, came a recognition that we needed better navigation in in the capital district. That we needed to find a way to get those young people. Um, off the streets to get those young people uh, to the services uh, that they need. And so out, uh, out of that was born uh, the, uh, the, the Navigator program, a very successful pilot program, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, that has, that, that in many ways embodies what, uh, what Bernie Smith uh, was talking about uh, earlier, that we can, we can deal with the problems on, on, on Spring Garden area by getting tough, and, and, and criminalizing people and forcing them off the streets. But we can also deal with, with problems by finding out those issues, of identifying those issues, and navigating people to the services that are out there. One of the things that we found, Mr. Speaker, for those of us who've, uh, who've um, followed the Nunn inquiry, uh, Mr. Justice Nunn was saying that the city and the province failed many times to intervene and many times to, to divert uh, and navigate people away from it. And that's the philosophy behind uh, the Navigator program. We know that in many cases the services are there and that we have to find a way to get people to those services. And I want to thank the, the uh, uh, Bernie Smith, Paul McKinnon, and, uh, and Tim Olive on the Dartmouth side uh, for their work in, uh, in getting the Navigator program. Uh, I will be, I will be talking, uh, I, I will be talking uh, more a little bit with my uh, colleagues on both sides of the house about trying to find more resources for the Navigator program so that we can we can build it some more. But I want to begin by you know, begin by, by by complimenting the ministers on, on this side of the house, and I should say uh, the former uh, ministers as well on the other side of the house for providing some of the seed money that created that pilot uh, project. I'm hoping, Mr. Speaker, that what, uh, what the Spring Garden Area Merchants Association uh, did and what the Downtown Halifax Business Commission did and the Navigator Program could be a model that we can build on uh, in, uh, in other towns and in other apl applications. I wanted to say, uh, say Mr. Speaker, that uh, the economy of Halifax itself uh, is, uh, is in, in, in great shape. And I think one of the things that we need to do, uh, and in, in, in particular I need to do, is, is remember that Halifax might be the, the, the hub here, but Halifax is also, uh, uh, the, the city of Halifax can play a larger role in, in, in supporting the economy of the rest of, of, of Nova Scotia. And I'm particularly proud, Mr. Speaker, of, of, of one development uh, that has, um, opened the last month, and that's the farmer's market. The farmer's market, Mr. Speaker, the Halifax farmer's market uh, rep represents everything that's great and good about the city of Halifax and also about, uh, about rural Nova Scotia and, and rural farmers. It is an extraordinary partnership, Mr. Speaker, where m members of my constituency uh, are saying that we want to buy local, we want to support our local in, in, uh, farmers, we want to make sure that, that we eat healthy food that hasn't traveled long, uh, long distances. And so the, 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 the uh, residents of my constituency have, have supported this, this alliance with farmers. And every week on Saturday morning, uh, you will find them there, um, along with the member for Halifax, Chabacto. And, uh, and myself, we're still waiting for, uh, for the uh, bench that's going to be put in for both of us, but uh, we've spent many years there. It's not there, but we hope, we hope it's there. But it is a, it is a great place to meet um, our, our both uh, con our, our constituents, but also to meet uh, 
people from rural Nova Scotia, for whom the farmer's market is a lifesaver, for whom the far farmer's market is their last chance to sell their product. And I know, Mr. Speaker, that when the farmer's market was first being created, uh, the new farmer's market, uh, people thought that it was, uh, it was just going to be a fad, a beautiful bells and whistle green building. Um, but it has already uh, outgrown its, its, itself. The, the, the market is full and, and it, soon it'll be open uh, seven, days, uh, seven days a week. And there, there, will be, uh, there will be regular stores there with, uh, with uh, producers from all across the, the province. Uh, and they're also opening up an international uh, market, uh, which I believe is opening next week, Mr. Speaker. And the international market is, all, is, is doing something that we in, uh, in the um, government of Nova Scotia are trying to do. We're trying to diversify our products. We're trying to get more, uh, um, more um, variety. Uh, we're trying to get more diversity in our, in our communities. And the Farmers Market, uh, International Market Day, is going to showcase what, uh, uh, what new products and what our new newcomers and immigrants are, are doing uh, for this province. And I'm very much looking forward, Mr. Speaker, to sampling that and to, to looking at this innovation uh, in action. But the farmer's market, as I was saying earlier, Mr. Speaker, embodies uh, what, uh, what uh, politics is, is really all about, that we do need to build alliances uh, across this province uh, between urban uh, consumers l largely and producers, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, uh, and, and, uh, and rural uh, producers. We do need to, to buy local. We do need to keep uh, our rural communities alive. And the best way to do that is to make sure that we, that we support them uh, in, in, in the pocketbook. I want to also say something, uh, Mr. Speaker, about uh, the, uh, the seaport uh, market. Um, along the waterfront uh, as well, uh, we have the Port of Halifax. The Port of Halifax, again, Mr. Speaker, was there at, at the creation, it seems. Uh, it may not have been there in its present form, but it was there. We, we, uh, the Port of Halifax was there when the Cunard ships uh, were being launched. Uh, I know the Blue Nose came from Lunenburg, but it spends a lot of time uh, on the waterfront. But the, but, the, but the waterfront itself is a great center of economic uh, activity. And in recent years, uh, the, the Port of Halifax has made great investments in deepening the harbor and rebuilding uh, the piers. And I'm delighted to say that this, uh, this uh, year, these last few months, uh, the Port of Halifax has set record uh, um, uh, records in terms of people coming here on cruise ships, uh, containers coming in. And I know that uh, two years ago there was a great, great deal of gloom and doom about the future of the Port of Halifax, but I'm happy to say that the Port of Halifax is rebounding, and in particular the markets uh, from Asia and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and beyond. I was, reading a, uh, I was reading a Vietnamese uh, magazine about uh, the shipping uh, trade last uh, two weeks ago at a conference that I, I, I was at. And in that uh, article uh, was a story about the Premier's uh, a visit to, uh, to, to Vietnam. And the, uh, the mayor of, of that city, I've forgotten that name, was saying that uh, they met with the, with the Nova Scotia delegation and they met with the Premier. And at that time, they had not realized that, no, that the port of Halifax was, was closer to them and closer to, to Europe and closer to North American markets. And that conversation led to the introduction of a new shipping line that began to call on Halifax uh, this summer, Mr. Speaker. And I was delighted to see a reference to that and to know that, you know, that those kinds of, of, of emissions, that those, uh, those types of initiatives, that kind of entrepreneurship produces millions of dollars in revenue, it helps our economy, and it helps build bridges uh, with people in, in other parts of the world, and, and facilitates trade that we haven't really uh, explored uh, before. I'm not sure how much time I have, Mr. Speaker. Uh, perhaps about uh, around uh, 11.55 would be a good time to wrap it up. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'll, um, I'll just, uh, I, I don't want to, to close completely, but, uh, but uh, for, the, for the moment, um, I'd like to, to, to say a little bit more uh, about, about the seaport. Mr. Speaker, um, 
Like places all over the world, um, the waterfront uh, was in serious uh, decay uh, less than a, a decade ago. But if you go to the Halifax uh, seaport now, along Marginal Road, uh, you will see um, uh, Pier 21, Canada's uh, National Museum, just declared Canada's National Museum within the last couple of months. It's the only national uh, museum outside of, uh, of Ottawa. And, the, and I want to commend, uh, in particular, the, uh, the board at, the, at, at Pier 21 and Ruth Goldblum, whose great energy and great passion and great vision has led to, uh, has brought us uh, uh, to this moment. Not a day goes by when you go to Pier 21 and you see a number of busloads of, of, of people there uh, wanting to, uh, to talk about uh, or to inquire into uh, Nova Scotia's immigration history. There's also the opportunity there, Mr. Speaker, to find out about one's own family history. And I, I see people squealing with delight at seeing the, listing, the names of their family members who've come there and what baggage they carry uh, with them. And so I, 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 Pier 21 is a, is a great asset and has just been developed as part of a reclaimed uh, waterfront. I see I'm getting the nod there, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to, uh, to adjourn now, and I'd like to continue at, at, uh, at a future date. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the motion is to adjourn debate. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning debate uh, signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. I'll now recognize the Deputy Government House Leader for Monday's uh, business. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that uh, adjourns uh, government business uh, for today, uh, Mr. Speaker, and we'd like to meet again on Monday, uh, November 1st, uh, between the hours of 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. Uh, after daily routines, we'll uh, call uh, uh, government motions, address and reply, and public bills for second reading, uh, Bill Number 74 and Bill Number 75. The motion is that we adjourn then until 7 p.m. on Monday. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those against say nay. The motion is carried. We are adjourned until 7 on Monday.